Hi everyone, hope you are all safe and well as we now finish week six of sheltering in place. And news from this side of the infection curve, as we very well know, is still not good. Uh, in the United States, there are roughly uh, 1 million confirmed cases, little under that, uh, with over 50,000 plus people who have now lost their lives uh, to this Wuhan coronavirus. And worldwide, uh, the numbers, 3 million worldwide uh, as of Saturday. And here in this country, there's now 26 million people, uh, greater than the economic uh, slowdown of 2008, 2009, uh, 26 million people now unemployed because of the lockdown in place. At the beginning of uh, this message, was a cartoon that I ran across uh, that shows just how pervasive uh, this Wuhan coronavirus has now become in our collective consciousness. Uh, it was a new humorous take on the ages old joke, why did the chicken cross the road? But as our nation, our state, and our cities and counties attempt to recover and to reopen, Getting to the other side, getting to the other side of the infection curve in both a safe and a responsible manner is the question that's now in front of all of us. And whether it's getting a future to be determined test, uh, test for antibodies, a test that can indicate a previous exposure to this virus and hopefully some uh, form of immunity whether it's getting back to our jobs, our work, the running of uh, shuttered businesses, our livelihoods, whether it's getting our kids back to school, or whether it's getting back to some semblance of life, life as we once knew it. Prior to this season of sheltering in place, uh, one great example is our meeting together again as a church body getting back to some semblance of life as we once knew it. And that's what getting to the other side represents amidst this very big current storm of life. So today, as we look at a familiar passage from scripture, uh, it's one in which Jesus and his disciples also attempted to get to the other side. And for them, the other side was the other side of the Sea of Galilee traveling in a small fishing boat. And they likewise would encounter a very, very big storm. So what were the larger lessons of faith and life that the Lord Jesus desired uh, for those followers, those first century followers to learn about him and also desires for us as followers today to learn as well? Let's all open our hearts uh, to those timeless lessons from our passage. Uh, it's taken from Luke chapter 8, verses 20 through 22 through 25, and included uh, the passage at the beginning of this video for the sake of time. The setting of our passage takes place on the large freshwater lake, also known as the Sea of Galilee. This huge lake was some 13 miles long and six miles wide. The Sea of Galilee, which is still uh, in Israel today, it lies some 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by hills and steep mountains uh, rising to roughly 3,000 feet. And because of this uh, particular geography, this lake, the Sea of Galilee, it's still subject to unannounced strong winds and to frequent, sometimes dangerous storms. The specific time that this passage took place uh, was unknown, but it's listed as one day. And one day Jesus instructed his disciples to prepare their boat in order to cross, get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Go to the other side of this large lake. The boat they were to take was probably a fishing boat belonging to uh, some of the disciples, fishermen turned followers of Jesus. 
And thanks to a 1985 archaeological discovery on the Sea of Galilee, we now have a very good idea of what this boat looked like. The boat measured roughly some 27 feet in length, some seven and a half uh, feet in width, and four feet in depth. The boat was equipped with both mast, sails, and oars in which uh, to power the boat. The fishing boat was made from either cedar wood or oak wood pieces that were joined or they referred to it as being pegged together. And the fishing boat was large enough, large enough to hold roughly about 15 people. So as Jesus and the 12 disciples sailed across what was then calm waters, we're told that Jesus fell soundly asleep. He must have been exhausted uh, from all of the ministry work being done up to that point, but he was resting comfortably in the stern or the back of the boat. And then, very suddenly we're told that, just like the theme song from Gilligan's Island, the weather started getting rough. And the tiny ship, the tiny fishing boat was tossed. They had encountered a furious squall, and by squall, it's defined as a dangerous wind-generated storm that came upon the Sea of Galilee, the small fishing boat, and the 13 people aboard. The once calm lake now became a dangerous and stormy sea. Nature's fury producing waves that were so huge that they broke over and mercilessly pounded the helpless boat, threatening to capsize the boat. And try to imagine the disciples did all they could just to simply try to weather the storm, to try to get through it as water continually swamped their boat. And then they were simply just trying to hang on for dear life not fall into and drown in the raging waters. Meanwhile, we're told from the passage that Jesus, oddly enough, remained asleep while this furious storm raged on. And we can now imagine in a sort of last act of desperation, the disciples, many of whom were very experienced fishermen, who had sailed many times on the Sea of Galilee, they went to wake Jesus, crying out to him for help, for their deliverance, their rabbi. They wanted him to rescue them, rescue them from this storm, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. This journey was about to reveal for the disciples that their intended destination, which represents getting to the other side of the lake, was not as important as the process of getting there. And I'll repeat that for our sake as well. The journey of getting to the other side was not as important as the process, the process of getting there. So what truths did the disciples learn about Jesus in this process of getting there? Well, one profound truth we can uh, take away from this passage is this. Jesus' power and authority was found to be even greater than, even greater than the power of nature. The full extent of Jesus' nature and his authority in Luke's gospel was very carefully and progressively unfolded to its readers by its author, Dr. Luke, in the retelling of Jesus' uh, life and ministry. And the portrait of Jesus painted up to this particular event, it had included uh, these things. His powerful and authoritative teaching through both parables and also wisdom sayings. Jesus casting out a demon that had been possessing a man in the Jewish synagogue in the town of Capernaum. 
the physical healing of Peter's mother-in-law, and then numerous other healings that Jesus had performed on people from physical affliction and also unclean spirits. And then the restoring of life, the restoring of life to a young man who was an only son to his widowed mother after he had physically died. Those were some of the big events that Dr. Luke chronicled prior to this story on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples had been there on those previous events to witness, to experience, and also to authenticate Jesus' power and his authority. However, even they, they were not prepared after seeing all of that for what was about to take place on the Sea of Galilee. From our passage, after being frantically awakened by his disciples and their cries for help, we're told that Jesus got up, got up for, from where he'd been sleeping in the back of the boat, and he then rebuked, rebuked the furious wind and the raging waves. He commanded the wind to cease, and then he commanded the waters to be still, to be still. And immediately we're told, everything became calm. The storm had, subsi had subsided. And likewise for us, our question to answer in this part of the journey that we're on, as we look to the other side of this storm that we're currently in, the coronavirus and this infection curve, do we likewise place our ultimate faith and trust in the hands of the very same Jesus, our Lord, whose power and authority is greater than the powers of sin and death? whose power and authority is greater than the powers of science, greater than the powers of nature, and greater than even the powers of this coronavirus. The Word of God tells us, the name of the Lord is a fortified, strong tower a strong tower against any enemy or foe, and the righteous run to it and are safe. From Proverbs 18, verse 10. Again, Jesus' power and authority are even greater than, even greater than you fill in the blank, whatever storm that we may face in this earthly life. And a second truth from our passage about what the disciples, the followers of Jesus, learned in the process of getting to the other side is this. Jesus is not a, is not a safe God. He is not a safe God, but he is a good God. He is a good God. The Word of God tells us uh, in Psalm 145, verse 9, The Lord is good to all. He is good to all. And His tender mercies, His compassion, are over all His works. Goodness is a part of God's character and His nature. That's who the God of the Bible is. He is good. And a il good illustration of this for all of you uh, who have read C.S. Lewis. He was the popular uh, Christian author uh, who wrote the classic uh, series, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. And the one book that everyone uh, knows of is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But in that particular book, it's a faith-based fantasy book, he wrote of four children, four children 
two brothers and two sisters. Their names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, who during the days of World War II, they happened to walk through the back of what was called a wardrobe, which was a standing wood closet. And that wardrobe was magical. They were transported to this fantasy world called Narnia. And Narnia was ruled by a great lion, a lion whose name was Aslan. And the character in the story, Aslan, represents the Lord Jesus. When those children first discover that Aslan is a lion, naturally they become nervous, somewhat afraid. And one of the children, Susan, then asked the question to one of Narnia's uh, residents. Is he, Aslan, is he quite safe? To which the animal character to whom the question was addressed, Mr. Bieber, replied in this way. Of course he isn't safe. Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's good. And that was also an important lesson and truth that was to be learned for the disciples, hopefully to be learned for us as well in getting to the other side. From our passage, as Jesus, by his spoken words, had shown through this great miracle, his power and authority was even greater than the powers and the forces of nature, Try to imagine the collective reaction of his disciples to what had just taken place. It was one of stunned amazement and utter reverent fear. Stunned amazement and utter reverent fear. What they had just experienced, this was something only God could do. And then they matter-of-factly asked each other, Who is this? Who is this man? He commands even the winds and the water. And they obey him. And they obey him. And though the disciples at this particular point of time did not fully grasp Jesus' identity, they also knew this. They also knew this. This man who was their friend and rabbi, he was not an ordinary man like them. And they also knew that this man, Jesus, he was more than a prophet or messenger of God. He was more than just a good moral teacher. And he was also more than a miracle worker, more than that. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, wanted them to know and understand that he was not safe. And by not safe, he was someone, the Lord, who could not be tamed, controlled, or manipulated. And like a great lion to be feared, and not a kitten to be petted or domesticated, Jesus would not bow down to or give in to cultural, societal, or personal demands or expectations. He was God. He was not safe. And by not safe, Jesus was also someone who ultimately controlled the destinies of the disciples, their destinies. They found out on that lake that they were not in control of. They were not the masters of their own destinies. It was Jesus. But the Lord Jesus also wanted his disciples to know that he was good. He was also good. Not just in what he did, but who he is but who he is, part of, again, again, his character and his nature. The Lord Jesus loved them. He had chosen them. He was for them. 
he would sacrifice his own life for the forgiveness of their sins. And he would be with them as they would live out and fulfill his greater mission, always to the very end of the age. And post-storm, after the storm, as the disciples eventually did get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus wanted his followers to know and understand that he would be able to deliver them, deliver them from, from whatever might come their way. And he would also help to get them to the other side, the other side representing what God desired for them, not only in their earthly journeys, but ultimately for their eternal, eternal journeys to go home to be with the Lord. The big question for them was, would they trust him? after all they had just experienced on the sea, would they trust him? And likewise for all of us, for whatever lies on the other side, again, of this coronavirus curve and an uncertain future, the Lord Jesus wants all who follow him today, all of us, to also know that he will be able to deliver us from whatever may come our way, from whatever may come our way. And he desires his best for us to get us to the other side, not only in the midst of our earthly journeys here and now, but ultimately our eternal journey home to be with the Lord. And hopefully in a positive way, this global pandemic, this storm that we're currently in, it's helped all of us to begin to discern what truly matters, what truly matters in this earthly life. Hopefully it's helped all of us to begin to reorder our values, our time, and our finances accordingly to what truly matters in this life. Hopefully it's helped all of us to draw close to the risen Jesus, to ask for his help and to follow, to obey him. And hopefully it's helped all of us, this storm that we're in right now, to live out his greater purposes for our lives, which are to love God, to love others, our neighbors, and to make the Lord God known, make the risen Jesus known living out our greater purposes in this earthly life. And like those first disciples, the Lord Jesus will also help us again to get to the other side, get to the other side of what he desires for us, not only in our earthly journeys, but again, on the other side of our eternal journeys, our homecoming with the Lord. And the reason for that, he's not a safe God, but he is a good God by his nature, by his character. So the closing question for all of us, that same big question that the disciples had too, the key to getting to the other side is this, will we trust him? Will we trust him? And with that, uh, let us close this time uh, with prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you now. We are in the midst of a very big storm. We need your help. We cry out to you. Help save us. Help us to draw close to you, even now, Lord. We acknowledge that your power and authority is greater than all things that this life may throw at us, including the storm of the coronavirus and its devastating effects. Your power is even greater 
your authority is even greater. Lord God, please help us to place our faith and our trust into your capable and good and powerful hands. Help us, Lord. Help us to get to the other side, the other side of this infection curve and the future. Help us also in the process of getting to the other side. Help us to learn the lessons along the way. Thank you, Lord. May you be glorified in and through our lives. We lift up all of these things to you this day. We ask that you would heal our land, our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And here our uh, closing benediction this morning, closing blessing from the Lord from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you all for watching. Uh, again, stay safe and well in the Lord, and we'll see you all next time.